You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai, and I'm here not with Jimmy, but with Jamie. Hello. This is Jamie Block, everybody. He is one of our writers here at the Command Zone. Jimmy, you're also our rules expert and kind of de facto judge for game nights as well. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun getting to be in the room on all these gameplay shoots that sort of, you know, having watched them as a fan for years, getting to really be in the room, feel like I'm part of it. It's it's a big deal. I enjoyed a lot. Yeah, and Jamie is also the person that I am texting late at night when I'm re- researching set reviews being like, how does this work? What's this rule? Because he, he is very good with uh, Magic Commander and game rules knowledge and all of that. He is here today to help us with the budget Precon upgrade guide for the Painbow Five Color Matters deck from Dominaria United. We're going to do the same thing we always do 10 cards in, 10 cards out for less than $30 in order to get this deck up to speed and ready to do battle with uh, quote unquote real decks as soon as possible. We're also going to break down the stats, the reprint value. We did do the deck reveal video for this, so some of that information will be, we'll go over quickly just because you maybe have already seen it. But before we get into that, if you want the Painbow deck, or the other, what is it, Legends Legacy deck, or anything from Dominaria United, go on over to channelfireball.com slash command. That is the place to go to get all of your Magic products, singles, anything at all, your Magic players. You're going to buy Magic cards. You may as well use our affiliate link when you do it, because not only are you getting the cards you want for your brand new decks, you are also supporting the content you enjoy. Channel Fireball Marketplace, great place to get your cards. Have really good prices on sealed product, and this is the time to be buying draft boosters, collector boosters, all of that. So again, Channel Fireball dot com slash command or you can use the code the promo code command at checkout if you forget to put in the url which i always forget to do jamie <laughs> even on our own stuff i should just bookmark it probably yeah i just have at this point all my autofills are right. slash command so it just it takes care of it for me that's nice uh and of course once you get the cards you want to protect them you want them to stay in pristine condition Ultra Pro is the game accessories brand that Jimmy and I, we trust our entire collections to. I have all my decks in Ultra Pro sleeves of some kind or another, mostly Eclipse. I have all of my decks inside of Ultra Pro deck boxes, Satin Towers, Mythic Collection. We love to play on Ultra Pro playmats. We print all of our own personal Game Nights and Command Zone branded stuff on Ultra Pro playmats because they really just make the best stuff. They have wall scrolls, dice, anything you need to adorn your Battlefield or your game room, Ultra Pro has you covered. And we also have an affiliate link with them, which is ultrapro.com slash command. They have an online store now. This is kind of a new thing. One of the great things about the online store is there are lots of like really crazy discounts on there all the time because they're just trying to move inventory a lot. So you can find some really good deals. Uh, Again, ultrapro.com slash command. And of course, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. All kinds of cool perks for patrons. We recently overhauled a couple months ago the whole system so we could just give our patrons more stuff. Um, One of the really cool things we're doing is we have exclusive content that's only available on the Patreon. Uh, We do sort of an after-game discussion for extra turns called Turn Talk. We released one of those episodes to the public uh, a couple of weeks ago just so everybody could sort of see what that was. But there are a bunch more of those episodes available through Patreon, and we plan to do them for every extra turns going forward. I've actually learned a lot just making the episodes, and now I watch them even if I didn't play in the game. I don't know if You've checked them out, Jamie? Yeah, I have. It's just, it's an irresistible part of Commander to have that sort of after game chat yourself. Like, I, a lot of my best Commander memories recently, at least, are more about the conversation I had with people after the game about, oh, like, if this had happened differently, what would have happened? Uh, Just, did you really have the win on your next turn? No, I think I could have stopped you. And this just sort of scratches that itch uh, for YouTube content. Yeah, and I think you can actually learn a lot, too, just getting into the minds of other players and what they were thinking, and it can better your play. So, again, patreon.com slash command zone. And, of course, one of the other perks of being a patron is we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to Mark Ross. Ross. Mark, you You rock. rock. All right, let's get into it here. The Painbow Five Color Matters Precon budget upgrade guide. We did do the deck reveal for this deck. It was episode 481, which is a couple of weeks ago. Um, And we also talked about both of the main commanders in this deck, Jensen and Jared, in our commander set review, the multicolored set review part one. So a lot of this stuff we would normally cover in one of these, we've kind of gone over, so we'll do it quickly here, or we might skip some parts. So if you're interested in going more in depth on that stuff, 
check out those two episodes. Um, we're still doing the same parameters we always do. We're going to add 10 cards. We're going to take 10 cards out. Jamie took point on figuring out what those cards were going to be. We want the total budget of that to be $30 or less. Again, we're trying, we find these to be good for newer players um, or players that, you know, maybe haven't been brewing a lot on their own because uh, I know deck building can be super daunting um, to sort of make this sort of easy and quick and hopefully cheap. Um, usually we leave the mana base as is on these decks, on the pre-con decks, but because this is a five color deck, we may tweak with the mana base a little this time around. We'll talk about it at least. Okay. Uh, just because it is sort of harder and more important to sort of smooth out being able to cast your spells in a deck that's exactly. five colors. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the cards here. We've got... Two new commanders in this deck. Um, Jamie, do you want to read the first one? The sure. face commander? Yes, the face commander is Jared Carthalian. He costs Wooberg. He is a legendary planeswalker. Uh, he starts with five loyalty. So five mana for five loyalty. That's fine. Uh, you can uptick him plus one to make a 3-3 three, three Kavu creature token. That's all colors. Oh, and it has trample. Uh, you can minus three him to choose up to two target creatures, and for each of them, you put a number of plus one, plus one counters on that creature equals to the number of colors that creature is. So those five color Kavus become eight eights. That's pretty good. With Trample, I didn't even realize the Trample until just now. Yeah. The minus six, so the ultimate sort of, is to return target multicolored card from your graveyard to your hand. If that card was all colors, you draw a card and you make two treasure tokens. And of course, Jared Carthalian can be your commander. So it starts with five loyalty, the negative six, quote unquote, ultimate, not much of an ultimate. It's more like a value play. Yeah, it's more of an in case of emergency break planeswalker situation where maybe there is going to be some multicolored card in your graveyard that you gets you out one. of a bind. But also, I would say like, it's actually kind of good when the ultimate's not that scary because players tend to not worry about it because it's like, well, if the ultimate's like game winning they have to team up and stop you from doing it because they can literally see, like, if you're going to Tammy ult or something, that's you're going to win. But uh, Jared might be like, eh, you know, I'm going to do something else here and not attack the Planeswalker because worst case scenario, gets a card to hand from Graveyard, draws a card and makes two treasure. That doesn't feel like I'm going to lose the game on the spot. Yeah, and what they might be doing is even just trying to keep it out of range of the middle ability, the minus three. And even then, worst case scenario, you're getting a sort of free at this point, three, three trample every turn. That's not the worst if players are letting you keep that utility on board. Yeah, so seems pretty good. Obviously cares about creatures being f m a lot of colors. Doesn't actually care specifically if they're all colors or not, right? Right. It wants them to be a lot. It is better the more colors they are. So if they are all colors, you are getting the most value out of that minus three. But yeah, if they're three or four colors, uh, putting three plus one plus one counters on each of two target creatures can be a big combat impact. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at the other commander that comes in the box. Jensen Carthalian, Druid Exile, costs a green and a white for a 2-2 two -two legendary creature human druid. It says whenever you cast a multicolored spell, scry one. If that spell was all colors, create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying and vigilance. That's a Sarah angel. Jensen also has an activated ability. You can pay five, tap Jensen, and add Wooberg, one of each mana color, to your mana pool. So Jensen cares more about all colors and five colors than Jared does. If you cast just a multicolor spell, you, you scry one, which is pretty meh, right? Yeah. It's fine. I don't know if you would run a commander that just said literally, whenever you cast a spell, scry one for two mana, if that was all it did. Right. And this is multicolored, so it's even like... Yeah, it's even more restrictive than that. Uh, does kind of fix your mana, but there's no ramp involved there. So you pay five mana in, tap Jensen, and you get five mana out. In fact, you're almost down a little because tapping Jensen, you could just play a mana dork, which would add mana and you'd get more coming out than you had going in. Um, so really the big payoff for Jensen is you cast a spell that is all colors, uh, which will apply to cards that have Wooberg in their casting costs. Um, I guess somewhere down the road, if they added another color, it would change the meaning of that. But for now, it can either say it's all colors in its rules text or have, all, you know, one of each mana at least in its casting costs, and that will count it as all colors. However, important to note for newer players, color identity in the commander sense does not apply here. So if it has Wooberg in its text box, say like uh, Kenrith or something like that, Kenrith is not considered all colors for the purposes of Jensen. You would not get an angel for casting Kenrith. A little confusing. Hopefully everybody kept up with that. 
the real question for this for Jensen and versus Jared and and you know we always ask the question when doing these budget upgrade guides is like which of the commanders that are in the box should you play you know when you play the deck as your commander and when we're doing these 10 cards in 10 10 cards out you kind of need to build towards one of the legendaries so we're always trying to make the case for which one it is first so that that can inform the decision we're making later and for Jensen the question is really going to be how many spells in the deck are all colors because I think that's really the only interesting part about him, right? Yeah, and the answer is not enough. Yeah, spoiler alert. Yes. There are not very many, so we're going to be building around Jared. In fact, it's time to get into the next section, which is the... Stats. 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 Hey, pretty good. Thanks. On the stats thing. I was impressed. All right, uh, deck stats. Do you want to read them, Jamie? The At least the foundational ones that we do for every deck. Sure. So this deck has 18 pieces of ramp... 14 of which are fixers, by which we're meaning you really have control over what color of mana you're going to be able to get with it. And that could be as simple as just tutoring a basic. You at least get to choose which basic. Whereas a card like Explore, for instance, you're sort of at the mercy of the lands that are in your hand. So that's not necessarily going to fix you for whatever color you want. But still, 18 ramp pieces. That's a lot. That's good. You yeah. need you need it in a deck like this. Yeah, that's a lot of ramp. We we want like ten to twelve, maybe ten to thirteen. Um, yeah, just to expand on the ramp versus fixing thing, you think of like Soul Ring, which is not in the deck, by the way. It ramps you a lot, but does not fix you. It d- it does not give you extra colors or access to colors you did not have before casting it. it even like Llanowar Elves is not fixing, right? Because you need a green to cast it, and then it gives you a green. Well, you already had a green. So it ramped you, but it did not fix you. Whereas Rampant Growth, like you said, I could have two forests and go find a mountain with it, and that gave me access to a new color that I did not have access to before casting the spell. Not usually super important, but for a five-color deck, it kind of is, which is why we wanted to mention it. Yeah, especially a five-color deck with a five-color commander rather than just with some activated abilities. That's true. It'd be different in Kenrith or something like that, right? Where it's like, well, I mostly want white. I get him out, and then eventually, yeah. Okay, uh, let's go on to card draw here. Yes, card draw, there are 12 of them. Pretty good. That's right in line with what we want. That's great. Single target removal, 11. Again, we're, we're, we're even moving up in this category as far as our suggestion to everybody out there, and I think this is right in line with what we would want, so this is looking good. Yeah, and board wipes, 6. Wow, that's even maybe higher than I would want. <laughs> yes, and, and I will say a few of the board wipes in the deck do not necessarily hit everything. Some of them are damage board wipes that are not necessarily going to hit some of the bigger threats on the table, but still, there are six board wipes. There are six cards that at least could be a board wipe. Right. And we'll often count things like Vandal Blast, which is, again, it's not in the deck, but as a board wipe, even though it only hits one card type. Um, Okay, so those are sort of the categories every deck needs, and this looks, from the outside, pretty good. Now, again, we're not going into how good each of those individual ramp pieces are or whatever, but the numbers look right. Um, so then deck specific stats, multicolored spells, that's a really important component to this deck because both commanders kind of care about it. There are 37 of those, uh, 11 are all colors. So that's Jensen, right? There are only 11 cards you could cast that would give you an angel in the whole deck. Pretty low. Jared cares specifically about creatures that are multicolored for that negative ability. There are 24 creatures out of the 37 multicolor spells, and 13 are non-creatures. And I think that's a pretty good roadmap for us because we always say somewhere around 25 of something is when you start to like have enough that it's your theme. So 24, seems like we're moving towards Jared. Uh, and then just multicolored payoffs, other payoffs besides your commanders, there are 12 of them in the deck. So uh, no surprise, but it's, it is a multicolored theme deck. So the next question we always ask, but I think we've already answered it, is who you should run as the commander. It's clearly Jared. It is clearly Jared. There's just not enough five-color cards to support Jensen. And Jared, even if there were, seems a little stronger, potentially. Just upticking to make a 3-3 trampler and then being able to turn two of them into 8-8s, that to me is bigger than having to spend at least five mana most of the time to get a bonus 4-4 angel every so often. Yeah, and we talked about this in the set review. Even if you decided to, in this episode, say all 10 cards were going to be five-color cards, that would bring you up to 21. There are not that many five-color or all-color cards that even exist in Magic. Way less than you would think. Less than 40. And a lot of those are very specific, like Reaper King and things you wouldn't want to add, you wouldn't want to play. So there's you're really... There's only like 10 or maybe 14 playable five-color cards. Some of them already exist in the deck. So yeah, just building around Jensen just would be tough. So we're going to build around Jared. 
Jensen still probably stays in the deck, though, right? Yeah, getting that scry value isn't nothing. Getting the fixing for Wooberg to cast your commander on time if you have not found it through other means is not nothing. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things we talked about in the deck reveal and is important to note is, like, five-color mana base is a very difficult thing to pull off, and especially in a pre-con where they tend to... They're not going to give you fetch lands and shock lands and things like that, right, that you might have access to if you build a deck from scratch. So it is a worry that just, like, a, a very sort of inexpensive mana base for five color might be pretty inefficient. So you're, you're just going to want to sort of overcompensate a little bit for that. So keeping things like Jensen for the fixing... I don't think you would normally play a card like Jensen for fixing, but it's good enough in the deck out of the box that I think it's probably worth keeping. All right, let's get into the next section here, which is reprint value, everybody's favorite. Um, again, we went over this in the deck reveal, so we won't take a ton of time here. Reminder that our prices are taken from prior to when the deck, deck was revealed. So once deck is revealed, everybody knows the cards are going to re get reprinted, and generally those cards tend to drop in price at that point. But because... We always have the decks and are doing the deck reveals and things like that. We want our prices to be, you know, uh, consistent when we're comparing to Neon Dynasty or Crimson Vow or everything in the past. So it's important for us to just always compare it to prices before decks are revealed. In this case, the total reprint value of this deck was about $83.86, which is pretty low. Yeah, it sounds okay when you look at the price you could pay to get the deck, but when you compare it to some of the past decks it starts to look a little worse. Yeah, for instance, Strixhaven was $88 on average for all the decks, if you if you average them out. Forgotten Realms was $115 on average. Midnight Hunt, $103. Now, Crimson Vow was $75, and Neon Dynasty was $73, so we're above that at least. Those were kind of like historically bad, yeah. <laughs> like reprint value-wise. Each of those had one that was historically bad that dragged down the average right. from the other one that was at least okay. Uh, and then recently, New Capena was about 97 bucks, and Baldur's Gate was about 104 So I think it's safe to say this deck is well below reprint value-wise what we would hope for. I think it's fair to be disappointed by that $83.86 number, especially considering the fact that like they could just put a shock land or something in here to immediately give it 10 more dollars of value and bring it right in line. And it would be really warranted in a deck like this. So yeah, disappointing, Wizards. There you go. Okay. Notable reprints in the deck. Let's talk about the more expensive cards that were reprinted. There are three cards that are over $5 or, or sorry, $5 or more because one of them is exactly $5. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, JP, if you want to read them. Yes. So the first one is Crystal Quarry. It's a land that can tap for colorless or you can pay five and tap it to add Wooberg. And that was nine eighty five, dollars almost 10 bucks before uh, the reprint was announced. And no surprise because like we were saying, lands are among the most expensive things you know, cards in Magic, like a lot of the more expensive cards, like the Dual Lands and Guy's Cradle and things like that, are lands. Um, the next biggest reprint is also a land, very similar to Crystal Quarry. It's Cascading Cataracts. Does basically the same thing. It's indestructible, and you can choose the combination of colors you get when you pay five and tap it. It doesn't have to be Woodward. You can say, oh, I want two blue and, f and three red. Um, but that was about $6. Yeah, four. which goes to show that Crystal Quarry is sort of objectively worse than Cascade and Cataracts, but was going for more. So this was somewhat of a scarcity yeah, for situation sure. for the price. But still, it's it's nice to get it back. Yeah, because cards kind of raise in value for a couple of reasons, one of which is just how powerful they are, but the other is like how available they are. So, uh, And then the last card that was $5 or above? It's Okagachi, Vengeful Kami. And this one is a reader. <laughs> uh, for one in a Wooberg, you get a legendary creature, Dragon Spirit. It's a 6-6 flying trample. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, if that player attacked you on their last turn, you get to exile something that they control. So importantly, it's a five-color card that is good with both Jensen and Jared. Would get five counters off of Jared and make it an 11-11 flying trample. Uh, the trample is important because it will trigger the ability pretty easily. Yeah, and was had only been printed one time, I think, so that's why it was $5. Um, let's move on to the cards that were between 2 and $5. I will not read all of these cards. I'm going to go through them rather quickly, but just so you know, Surak Dragonclaw, about three seventy-five. dollars 75 Faberal Elder, a really good reprint that I think we needed, $3.65. Mills from Nexus, Path to Exile, Bad River, Murmuring Bosk, kind of surprising that it was up there in price, Nethroi, Apex of Death, Baleful Strix, all of those are between 350 and two bucks. Um, yeah, so 
I mean, it's just a low number. I think all the reprints themselves are mostly fine and in line with what pre-cons normally have, but I think we could have had two to three more cards in the $5 or above category. Yeah, exactly. This deck easily could have had a higher reprint value if they had not recently been good about reprinting some of these good cards. Yeah, Faber, that's true. Faber Elder a couple of reprints ago was much more expensive than it is now. So on the one hand, you're giving us cards that have utility, but on the other hand, the reprint value is thus not quite there. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about what the best cards in the deck are going to be or are just because we can't cover all cards, but it's fun to talk about a few. Uh, the first two are reprints, Faber or Elder, which we just mentioned. It's kind of the budget bloom tender, right? It is, exactly. It is a bloom tender that also gets big and can be a decent combat threat. Just being able to, assuming you have your commander out and thus it is a 5-5, five, five, you can swing in for 5 Vigilant damage, then tap it to add 5 mana. That is a lot of utility from one 3-drop. Yeah, pretty good. Um, Knight of New Alara is the next one. It is 2 a green and white, so 4 mana for a 2-2, two, two, but each other multicolored creature you control gets plus 1, plus 1 for each of its colors. So those Kavus become 8-8s eight and then become 13-13s with Trample. Exactly. Yeah, this that's is pretty a, good. <laughs> yeah, this is a card I have some nostalgic love for, and just when am I going to get another chance to say that it's the best card in anything? It is, in most decks, not putting in that much work, but here it is pretty incredible. All right, and then there are two new cards, which we think are some of the best cards in the deck, which is kind of cool. Uh, mana Cannons is the first one. It's two and a red for an enchantment. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, Mana Cannons deals X damage to any target where X is the number of colors that spell is. Um, just turns your casting of spells into damage and removal. I think this is going to see play outside of five color decks, even if you're in a deck that just has 20 or so multicolored spells, because it's going to do a minimum of two, right? And just two damage tacked onto all the spells, you, or a lot of the spells you cast, it is worth it. Yeah, if every spell were also a free shock, that's pretty incredible. And I think we'll just, we'll see with time. I think this card will be relatively popular, and we will work out where is the line of how many multicolored spells your deck needs to have for this to be worth an include. But certainly a multicolored theme deck, deck 37, that's Plan. enough. That's, that's definitely enough. It's, the line is somewhere above 20 and probably below 25. Right. Um, yeah, and these days, too, I will say, like, two damage is worth a lot more than it was three years ago. There are just so many more Timnas and, you know, little annoying things running around because so many people are playing sort of lower to the ground, decks, Ragavans, and things like that, um, that you do want to kill. Exactly, and in this deck with a five-color commander, just playing this on curve and then playing your commander later, knowing you're going to get to do five damage to something, it's really going to affect what your opponents are even willing to put out. That's a really good point. You've got mana cannons out. It's turn four. Your turn five is next. Do they even play a, a, a threat that has less than five toughness or less than six toughness, I, I guess? Yeah, that's pretty... Like, I wouldn't do it. I'd be like, oh, crap, I don't want to give them a good target. I'll play something less threatening or two little things. Yeah. Uh, and then the last um, card we're going to talk about in best cards in the deck is a pretty cool one and... Specifically for this type of deck, it's Falaji Wayfarer, two and a green for a two four. It says when, uh, or sorry, Falaji Wayfarer is all colors. This ability doesn't affect its color identity. So it can go in just mono green decks, but it will be considered uh, all colors when you play it. Similar, similar to Transguild Courier, although Transguild Courier, that is part of its color identity. Yes, Transguild Courier can only go in a five color deck. This can go in a deck that includes green, no matter how many other colors it is. I don't think we've ever... Have we ever seen the words color identity in rules text like that? I don't believe so, but I don't want to be quoted on that. <laughs> He's a Scryfall expert as well, so it, it, at the very least, it's uncommon to read that. Exactly. Um, and then has a second ability that says multicolored spells you cast have convoke, which means you you can tap your creatures as you cast a spell, and they will add one uh, mana of a color in that that creature is to pay for the spell. So for instance, Falaji Wayfair is all colors. So when you tap it to convoke out a spell, it can tap for any of the colors in that spell. So it it's kind of like a cryptolith right almost. Um, yeah, it's cryptolith right when you are casting multicolored spells. Yeah, yeah, multicolored spells you cast half convoke, remember. Okay, so those are the best cards in the deck. We've got all the reprint value out of the way. We've laid out that we're building around Jared Carthalian. We're going to come back in just a second and we're going to start the fun part, which is what? 10 cards. I'm putting the 10 in quotes because uh, there's there's actually 
There might be 11 cards on this one, and we'll tell you why in just a second, but first we're gonna take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. Whoa, whoa, don't get too close. Sorry, I'm Sten, paranoid partisan. It's not you, I just can never let my guard down. You see, hunting Phyrexian sleeper agents is a dangerous game, but I can't do it alone. That's why I use Indeed, the platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. I need employees I'm sure I can trust, but I can't abandon the hunt to spend ages trawling through resumes. But with Indeed, finding qualified investigators was fast and easy, thanks to tools like assessments, virtual interviews, and my favorite, Instant Match, which gives me a short list of qualified candidates the moment I sponsor a post. And Indeed makes sure every candidate meets my listed requirements. Honor, vigilance, loyalty, and most importantly, not a Phyrexian. Though at the end of the day, the only person I can be sure isn't a Phyrexian is me! Wait, what's this cord coming out of my arm? Yeah, it's probably nothing. Indeed knows that when you're doing everything for your company, you can't afford to overspend on hiring. Visit indeed.com slash command zone to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash command zone. Again, indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Crap, I'm late for draft night. I guess I'll just grab takeout. It's the fastest, cheapest thing. That's a fact or fiction. Fact or fiction. Uh... How long have you been out there? Longer than it takes to prepare a meal from Factor, that's for sure. You see, Factor delivers nutritious, chef-crafted meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. So takeout being the fastest, cheapest option is now a pure fiction. Factor is perfect for the on-the-go lifestyle. With no shopping, cooking, or cleaning, you'll have even more time to do the things you love. Every meal is dietitian approved, and with 30 plus choices each week, including vegetarian and protein plus options, you can eat healthy without ever getting bored. Oh man, that sounds great. I really wish I had a Parmesan. Parmesan crusted chicken with Italian veggies? Wow, this is delicious. Wait, where were you hiding it? You don't want to know. And that's a Factor Fact. Head to go.factor75.com slash command130 and use code command130 to get $130 off across six boxes. That's code command130 at go.factor75.com slash command130 for $130 off. Hello, I'm Dryad of the Elysian Grove here to talk to you about Me Undies, the comfortable underwear company that's taking the internet by storm. Now me, I never wear underwear. I like to feel the breeze on my vines. But when the open air gets nippy, I snuggle up with Me Undies' collection of clothes and accessories. That's right, Me Undies makes more than just underwear. They've got durable, cushy socks that make my feet sing. Just call me Dryad of the Elysian Groove, baby. Plus, they're super stretchy loungewear. Daily tees, shorts, and even rompers to add some silky softness to every phase of the day. Look, I even got this Catwoman hoodie for my dog. <laughs> like a tree, his bark is worse than his bite. Because trees don't bite, unless you ask nicely. Wink. And everything's available in sizes extra small through 4XL with tons of prints and more colors than I let your lands produce. So make like a me and leaf discomfort behind with soft and sustainable me undies. MeUndies has a great offer for fans of the Command Zone. For any first-time purchasers, you get 20% off plus free shipping and returns. To get 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash command. Again, that's MeUndies.com slash command. All right, we are back. We are talking about the Painbow Five Color Matters Jared Carthalian deck. We are doing the budget upgrade guide. I'm here with Jamie Block, our writer and resident rules expert. Let's just talk really quickly here, Jamie, before we start running down the, the 10 cards, which is actually going to be 11, I teased that before the break, um, that we're going to add. What were you thinking? You know, you looked at the deck, you looked at all the stats, you obviously looked at all the cards and stuff. As you started to formulate, like, look for cards that you might want to add, what were you thinking? Like, what did you think the deck needed? What were you worried about? You know, that kind of stuff. I think primary worry, just given that it is a pre-con mana base for a five-color deck, was just wanting to have at least a couple pieces that are going to help make sure that you're going to have the correct mana to cast the spells that you want to cast on curve. And then beyond that, it was really not running out of gas. There is a decent amount of card draw in the deck, but there's also a decently high curve just because, you know, with the exception of cards like Falaji Wayfarer, any card that is all five colors costs at least five. Yeah, so you got to get to five, have the, you know, the, the right colors, and then make sure that 
you don't just like cast two five drops, they get killed, and then you're just top decking. Exactly. Just making sure that when you are casting these big spells, you are getting some additional value for doing so. And Jared really doesn't give you card advantage. Yes, the negative six technically does, but you really can't count on, you know, like we said, it's not super scary. People may let you have it, but people do tend to just hit Planeswalkers for a couple damage here and there when they can, just to keep them off of anything crazy. So yeah, you don't want to rely on that Jared's (laughs) negative six as your card dry engine, right? (laughs) Exactly. Okay. So uh, I teased it a couple of times now. This is the first time ever we're going to add 11 cards to a deck, but we're not technically adding 11 cards. I mean, we are, but we're not. We're only going to still take out 10 cards. Yes, we're adding 11 cards, but are they all added to the deck right. in a technical sense? So, yes, we're being KG, but uh, maybe you, you caught on. Uh, companions do not count towards your deck's total amount of cards. And as you're going through this deck, you notice that it... With only taking out like one or two cards, right? Yeah, literally it, one card away. So if you took out one card from the pre-con, you can add it. There's a certain companion you can add, and it meets the criteria. What is that companion? Yes, that companion is Gigantha the Wellspring, which costs four and a hybrid red-green for a 5-5 five, five legendary creature, Elemental Elk. Its companion condition is that no card in your deck has more than two of the same mana pip. Which is, you know, has, you can't have two white Has pips. more than one, right? Or, or yes, has more than one. Has yeah. two or more. Yeah. So, so if, only- a, if, a, if a creature is green, green, and red, you can't have a Gigantha in the deck, right? Because he's got two green. But if it's green and red, you can. Exactly. And uh, it turned out this was very easy to include. There is one card that you had to cut from the deck in order to make this work. We will get to that when we're doing the cuts. But having a, it can also... Tap for Wooberg, and you can't spend that mana on generic mana cost, which is any time that there's just the number on a colorless background, that is a generic mana cost. But your commander costs Wooberg. Right, so for Gigantha's ability, let's look at, say, mana cannons, which we just talked about before the break. It could pay for the red, but not the two colorless in that casting cost in the top right corner. So it's not that helpful to cast mana cannons. Whereas to cast Jared, yeah, it can cast- pay for the whole thing straight up. Exactly, or any of the other all five color spells in the deck, of course, with the exception of cards like Falaji Wayfair. Yeah. But any time that the full Wooberg is in a casting cost, this is a huge help in casting it. And also just pretty good if it's like three, right? Like you don't have to get all five. Like a creature that taps for three mana is quite good. So, and you can do multiple spells too. You can be like, oh, this one has, it's Baleful Strix. There's my black and my blue. And then I'm gonna use my green on the Falaji Wayfair, but I'll add a couple mana you know, a couple lands, and then I'll use the white on something else. And then, so Jagantha ends up being quite strong. Yeah, and like every companion, it's the eighth card in your starting hand, which is just a big advantage. Yeah, so the companions start in the companion zone. I don't even know what you call it. Did they make an official name for it? I hope so. Okay, and then uh, they changed the rules on companion. Do you know them? Yes, you can pay three mana at sorcery speed to put it into your hand from, let's call it the companion zone. And then it's just in your hand, and there it is. Yep, and then you play it, and then it's just like a card you played. If it dies, it goes to the graveyard. You could reanimate it or whatever. Yeah, Uh, it has no rules that send it back to any companion zone. It is just, once it is put into your hand from there, it is just as if it had started the game in your deck. But it is your 101st card. So that's why we're adding 11 cards, because we only have to still take out 10. Exactly. Uh, and, and that card was not expensive. It's a $2.50 card. So it just seems like a no-brainer, because there's really no downside to adding it to the deck. You're cutting one card, which we might have cut anyway. It's, it's a fine card. It's um, fine. But we had a lot of board wipes already. We'll get to that in a second. And yeah, it's just kind of a freebie, so may as well do it. All right, what is the next card? This is, is this the most expensive card we're adding the next one? It's actually not. Oh, it's not. I have a grand finale. Oh, I see it at the end there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's the second most expensive card we're adding. Uh, it is Crystalline Crawler, which is a four mana artifact creature construct. It is a one one, but it has Converge, which means it will enter the battlefield with a number of plus one plus one counters on it equal to the number of colors of mana you spent to cast it. And then you can remove a plus one, plus one counter from it to add a mana of any color, and you can tap it to put yet another plus one, plus one counter on it. So at the very least, you can always tap it, put a counter on it, take that counter off, so it kind of eventually becomes a Birds of Paradise. But if you spend four different colors of mana when you cast it, it starts with four one, one counters, which means like the next turn, 
you can go, oh, I've got nine mana available and four of them are mana of any color that I want to. Actually, you'd have 10 because you can tap it that turn too. Yeah, it ends up causing really explosive turns and it's fixing a- and ramp for a deck like this. Yeah, I think this is just a fantastic card. It's also a great blocker for Jensen just because it's a four mana five five on top of everything else it is, assuming that you have had the mana to spend four different colors to cast it. Right. Um, all right, and that one was about $7. Uh, a very powerful card, but you need to be in a lot of colors to play it. What's the next one? The next one is Ornithopter of Paradise, which costs two generic mana. It's an artifact creature Thopter. It's a 0-2 flyer that can tap for mana of any color. Because it's of paradise, just like a Birds of Paradise. And this was 25 cents, so very cheap. Is just a kind of the same as a two-mana rock, but I do like that it's an O2 and could protect Jared if you had to. Yeah, it's a blocker in a pinch, and there's just there were a few ramp pieces in the deck that were just not good enough at finding the right color or didn't actually put you forward on mana. Maybe they found a land from your deck, but they put it into your hand instead of the battlefield. They were only fixing not ramp. It's just an upgrade for one of those in a deck that really cares about colors. And I think any time, in most decks, I think I would prefer like a signet or a talisman or something that is a rock as opposed to a creature, just because creatures die to board wipes and things. But actually, in a Planeswalker deck, I think I would prefer... The Ornithopter, just because, hey, if I'm near that negative six or something, and it's a little bit later in the game, and I don't care as much about that one mana, I might block to save myself and, and you know, make keep my Planeswalker alive or whatever. Right. All right, what's the next one? The next one is Tome of the Guild Pact. It is a five mana artifact that can tap for one mana of any color, but most importantly says, whenever you cast a multicolored spell, draw a card. And again, there are 37 of those in the deck, so that's pretty great. Yeah, I actually have a four-color Multicolored Matters deck, and this is the all-star of that deck. That's like the card you want out at all times? It is. I have, every time I can tutor for it, it's the card I'm tutoring for. You know, it's clunky. It's a five-mana artifact that taps to give you one mana. But just if it can last on board, and every spell you cast, or at least in this deck, Probably at least one in every two spells that you cast is drawing you a card for free at that point. That is a big game for staying in the game as it goes on. Yeah, I mean, honestly, and the fact that it taps for mana is just kind of gravy on top. I think you would be willing to play like a four mana artifact that does this. We play like Panharmonicon and things like that, which are basically essentially saying like, this does nothing right now, but it's going to magnify. It's a force multiplier for all the plays I'm going to make from here on out in the game. And so the fact that it does tap for mana um, is actually relevant because, you know, you're in a multicolor deck and it's just a little bit of gravy on top. Right. And that card was also going for just about 25 cents. That's great. We are... The, the next couple are actually only a quarter. I really like this next uh, card because it's kind of Jensen, but better. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so here we go. This card feels like the, we didn't put this card in the pre-con so that you can feel smart for finding it and putting it in the pre-con card. It is General Ferris Rockerick, which costs one and a red and a white. So three mana total for a 3-1 legendary creature human soldier. It has hexproof from mono colored, which is relevant. For sure, because Path to Exile and stuff can't hit it, right? Like, Yeah. Honestly, when you start running down the list of removal that people are likely to use, there's not a lot that hits this thing. Yeah, because people want to play one mana removal. Yeah. And one mana removal is By almost definition. certainly <laughs> going to be monocolored. Yeah, almost uh, always. Then the most relevant line of text, though, is whenever you cast a multicolored spell, you get a 4-4 four, four red and white golem artifact creature token. So yeah, it doesn't have flying and vigilance, but you don't need it, the spell to be all colors. You just get a 4-4 four, four on the ground, which is great. And yeah. the 4-4s the are two colors. Exactly. That matters. Anything you have that is just affecting the multicolored creatures that you have, Jensen's ability, Knight of New Alara, if that's yeah. out, then it's making 6-6s six automatically. Yeah, so it does have that other synergy with the deck. And just getting a 4-4, four, four, it's just like Tome of the Build, Guild Pack, basically, where every time I cast... In fact, it's very similar, because I'd say a 4-4 four, four is generally about worth a card. Absolutely. So... It is giving you a card's worth of value, and this is a three drop. So yeah, this card is a must include. Really good. 25 cents. Yep. Great, great one. Uh, the next card is a personal favorite of mine. It's Jory N. Ruin Diver. It's one, a blue, and a red for a 2-3 legendary Merfolk Wizard. Very simple. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, draw a card. Yeah, this deck has a lot of ramp. Hopefully you are going to relatively quickly get to a point where you are double spelling every turn, and you just want to make sure that as you are double spelling... You are not playing out your entire hand with nothing left. Yeah, this is a card draw engine. It is a multicolored creature. 
it fit it checks all the boxes and it, exactly. again only at 25 cents yep the next one we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna be more expensive it's 75 whole cents um go ahead this is Tatiova, Benthic Druid. It is three, a green, and a blue for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature, Merfolk Druid. And it says, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you draw a card and gain a life. Anybody who's been playing Commander for any amount of time has seen this card quite a bit. It's very popular, both as a Commander and just in decks. Because again, this is a card draw engine. Um, yeah, it turns the often not multicolored, so you aren't going to be getting those payoffs, ramp cards in the deck into something that will give you additional value when you play them. This deck actually does have some fetch lands too. Uh, it has that bad river. I believe it has like evolving wilds and those type of things as well. So fetch lands are really good because you'll get two draws off of Tatiova and gain two life. So, and then, yeah, if you add rampant growth variants and things like that, I don't know if any are in here, um, it becomes even better. But even just one card off Tatiova per turn is great because again, yeah. it is a multicolored creature itself. Yes, so you're getting all those payoffs as well. All right. Another 75 center coming up here. It's Moonvale Regent. This is three and a red for a dragon, which is four, four and flying. Whenever you cast a spell, you may discard your hand. If you do, draw a card for each of that spell's color. So if, if you, you cast, cast a five... To, <laughs> if you cast your commander right. and you don't like your hand or your hand is just smaller Small, than yeah. five cards, you might as well discard it and draw five cards. That's great. When Moonvale Regent dies, it deals X damage to any target where X is the number of colors among permanents you control. So again, if it dies and you have your commander out, you're going to deal five damage to something. That's pretty cool. I, so yeah, this actually helps you with the gas thing later in the game as well because you know you might get to a point where you've got like a five color spell, a couple of lands in hand, and that's it. So in that case, yeah, cast the five color spell, discard the two lands, and draw five cards. Seems great. Yeah. I think that it is a great way to refill your hand. I think the death trigger is notable. It's not the reason you're playing the card, but there are definitely going to be moments where it is sort of, it makes attacking you a bad idea for an opponent because you could block, the dragon will die, and you will, in retaliation, take out something that they care about. Yeah, true. And you could play it on turn four right before you play Jared, in which case it is a blocker for Jared as well. Absolutely. And if you have sort of ramped, ramped, played this turn four, and then you play your commander, maybe you have played out most of your hand at that point, and that is a great time for the refill to be effective. And remember, it's a May ability too, so it's fine to play it on four, play Jared, and just be like, nope, I'm keeping my hand. And just, you know, the next turn of the turn after that is when you actually pull the trigger on on, uh, on triggering the ability. Pull the exactly. trigger on triggering? Yeah. Uh, okay. We got a couple of cards left to go. Did I say that Moonvale Regent was 75 cents? So again, very cheap. This next one's back to 25 cents. Yes. This, this one. Is, this is an old school favorite. I used to play this a lot. Yeah, I like this one a lot as well. It is Bring to Light. It is three, a green, and a blue. So five total for a sorcery that uh, basically you tutor your deck for an instant sorcery or creature that costs less or equal to the number of colors of mana you spent to cast Bring to Light. Yep. And then you cast it without paying its mana cost. So it's always going to be two because you need a green and a blue. But if you do all five colors, you can find a five drop, basically, of a creature instant sorcery uh, card and just play it. Right. So that's tutor and play. Yes. So this can be a board wipe. This can be the creature you need it to be. In a pinch, this can be the ramp or spot removal that you need it to be. Those are slightly less impactful to pay five mana to go get. But right. if it's what you really need, this card can get it for you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, okay. Okay. And we are down to two more cards. I'm going to read this one so you can read your big uh, finisher, which is sure. the most expensive card on the whole list. You you saved up room in the budget to have this that that one big card. It seems like right. It did just kind it of is happen a good card. that way. Just because multicolored isn't that prevalent of a theme, a lot of the cards that care about it just don't cost that much. That's true. Well, and all, most of those cards are not useful in other decks, so their um, demand is not going to be as high, right? Exactly. All right, the next card is Broker's Ascendancy. This is one from New Capenna. It is a uh, green, a white, and a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each Planeswalker you control. I see why it's in here. It's just efficient, and it is also a multicolored spell. Yeah, it's a multicolored spell. It is a three-mana, three-colors spell for things like mana cannons that might care about that. Yep. And yeah, you are just you're getting free loyalty on your commander. You are getting free plus one, plus one counters on all of the Kavu or anything else that you are making. And in a deck that seems like its win con might just be, I have big creatures, a lot of whom have trample, just making them steadily bigger seems like a big game. That's great. All right, 
We are here at the the the. I was gonna say tenth. It's the eleventh card. This is the only time we've ever done this. Yep. Uh, and it is the most expensive. It is fifty. Oh, I should say, Brokers Ascendancy, fifty cents. Yes. This next card, fifteen dollars. It is a lot. It it's, a, is. it's a good deck unto itself. Yes. It is Ramos Dragon Engine, the six mana legendary artifact creature dragon that is a four four with flying and says, whenever you cast a spell, put a plus one plus one counter on Ramos for each of that spell's colors. And then you can remove five plus one plus one counters from Ramos to add double Wooberg, but only do that once per turn. But still, it's double Wooberg. Ten mana. Yes. Be content with your one instance of ten mana. Well, and yeah, there are... Other one plus one plus one plus one granters in the deck, like Broker's Ascendancy, which we just read. Um, Ramos is one of the first multicolored matters commanders I can remember. Maybe it was the first. Uh, and so naturally makes sense. I mean, if you cast Ramos and then you cast a five color spell, it gets nuts because you go, oh yeah, put five counters on him, take them off. Now I got 10 mana to cast two more five color spells. And you'll. Ramos will still get the counters from those other spells you cast. You just can't remove the counters for the double Wooberg that same turn. Yeah. It's crazy. You could have a crazy turn with this. You know, you play this. Maybe your commander has died once. You play this. Then you play your commander again. You can instantly get 10 more mana to play whatever you want. Maybe maybe even literally two more spells that are all five colors. Yeah. In which case, that Ramos is now also a 14-14 flyer on your side of the board. Exactly. Yeah, I think this is one of the first cards that a lot of people thought of when they saw the Jared deck. So it, it's fun to play with. You'll like it. Yeah, it's taking an old school, old school-ish, multicolored commander and putting him with the new multicolored commander. With the new hotness? Yep. All right, so that's going to do it for the cards we're going to add. It was $28.75 total. Most of that carried by Ramos and the Crystalline Crawler. Uh, but we did want to talk about some honorable mentions here real quick. You put down some honorable mentions. Uh, let me mention mine real quick just because it's Soul Ring. And I think it is like fancy play syndrome not to have Soul Ring in this deck. There are still a bunch of cards in here. By far, more, more cards you can use Soul Ring on than can't. Um, it's easy to sort of be like, oh, it's a five color deck. Soul Ring won't be that good. It's still going to be really good. It's still going to work with Ramos when you cast Ramos. It's still going to work with Moonvale Region. It's still going to work with maybe not Bring to Light as good. It's going to help with General Rokerik. It's going to help with Jorian a little bit. It's going to help with Tatiova. It works with Tome of the Guild Plaque. It works with Ornithopter of Paradise. It works with Mana Cannons. It works with Falaji Wayfair. Put Soul Ring in the deck. Okay, that's my pitch. Yep. <laughs> the next one we're going to argue about a little bit, I think. Yeah, Soul Ring, I don't disagree with you. The next one, uh, let's play. <laughs> yeah, the next one is Chromatic Lantern, which, just to get out of the way the price, it's going for about eleven fifty right now, which is a big reason why it was not in the actual cards to add list. This is three mana artifact. Lands you control have tap, add one mana of any color to your uh, mana pool, and it can also tap and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. I'm well known to dislike this card, and I would not run it. And I would run it because it is a five color deck where the mana base is not great. I would say if you have it in your budget and your willpower to fully upgrade the mana base of this deck, maybe don't put in Chromatic Lantern. But if you are looking to just add one card that can make a big difference rather than having to swap out. Honestly, but then you're telling them to spend $11.50 on a card that's pretty bad and they're not going to use again, probably. Like I would say just buy four guild signets. It's going to cost like less than $4 and you can swap out. I would just run a guild signet over the Chromatic Lantern anyway. Um, but, you know, then you can swap out a couple of maybe other of the worse or ramp cards and put in guild signets because I think it, on average, like I'd rather draw a guild signet than a Chromatic Lantern. I'll, still in this deck with this mana base. Because it's just hard to imagine, like I've got three or four lands in play in a guild signet and I somehow don't have, because a lot of, there's a bunch of tri lands in here. There are fetch lands, like most of the lands you're playing are going to tap for more than one color. So there's, I don't know, you probably could come up with it, but it's hard to come up with an array of a, like three or four lands and a guild signet where you don't have Wooberg. So I, that's my argument. Don't yes. run it. Don't spend 11.50 on it for sure. It's a mana lith. I have counter arguments, <laughs> but you have places to be perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. I respect that. Okay, let's move on because I do like the next one. And this card is cheaper than I thought it was going to be. 
Yeah, it's the World Tree. It's going for $3 right now, which is probably in large part because it can only go in five color decks. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, it is a land that can tap for, it enters the battlefield tapped, it taps for green, uh, but as long as you control six or more lands, all your lands tap for one mana of any color, and then it has an ability where you pay 10 mana, tap it, sack it, you find a lot of gods, that would not do anything in this deck. It is there more for the fixing element, but, you know, you could say that adding some of the cards I added is affecting the mana base, but just touching the lands is not a thing that I was looking to do in this particular upgrade, or else it probably would have made its way up onto the list. But it is absolutely a card to put in if you are upgrading the deck further. Yeah, and I would say the difference between that and Chromatic Lantern is it is your land drop for turn. It does not cost three mana, mm -hmm. which is why I like it a lot better. And then finally, in the honorable mentions, oh, World Tree, $3, did we say that? Yeah. Uh, is Conflux, which is $2.00. And it is three in Wooburg, so eight mana for a sorcery. Search your library for a white card, a blue card, a black card, a red card, and you guess it, a green card. Reveal those cards, put them in your hand, and then shuffle your library. It is a tutor for one card of each color. Remember, you could find five five-color cards here because you're like, that one's my blue one and that one's my red one. They don't have to be mono-colored uh, of the color you're choosing. So this is just... Generally, if someone plays Conflux, if they cast that and they resolve it, they are going to win next turn. So... You should be wary. <laughs> yeah, and that is sort of what pushed it to honorable mentions is I don't know if the deck necessarily has the tools right away to stop the aggression that you are going to receive if you resolve a conflux that you had to probably tap out to pay for. In general, playing eight mana for a sorcery that doesn't do anything right now is not the greatest deal. Uh, and then, of course, this deck is probably not equipped to win the game on the next turn necessarily. So a lot of times, your eight, if that's your your eight drop sorcery, somebody else is like, oh yeah, well mine is uh, expropriate or something. I guess it's nine, but still, you get what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, the saving grace of the card could be that fact in the sense that you do reveal the cards you found, and if your opponents see the cards you revealed and thought, oh, that's actually not that bad. Then maybe, maybe they don't kill you. Exactly, maybe you got away with it, <laughs> but you probably won't get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the 10 cards we've got to take out. Remember, we added 11, but we only have to take out 10 because the companion does not count towards the number of cards in your deck. Uh, and this card, this first one, is the one we have to take out so that Gigantha's, um, what is the, the... Companion condition? The condition can be met. Uh, it is Time Wipe, which costs two white, white, blue. So that's why there's two white pips in the casting cost. It is a sorcery. Return a creature you control to its owner's hand, then destroy all creatures. There were six board wipes in the deck. I don't think we're sad to just lose one uh, without much thought here just to get access to a whole other card in our opening hand, basically. Exactly. And there is another five mana board wipe in the deck. So I think of adding Bring to Light and the fact that that can get that board wipe. Oh, so you kind of did add a board wipe, but it's just a flexible one that sometimes isn't a board wipe if that's not what you need. Exactly. I like that. So I sort of consider this a direct swap where it's like Bring to Light can do what Time Wipe did, but it can also do other things. And it and Bring to Light doesn't negate uh, Gigantha from being in your deck. Exactly. All right. What's the next one? The next one is Radiant Flames. It is two and a red for a sorcery that deals X damage to each creature, where X is the number of colors of mana you spent to cast Radiant Flames. So... Up to three. ideally three mana for three damage to each creature. Exactly. Not not bad. It's not bad, but it's also not great. There are just so many things that it's going to miss. Yes, we live in a time where the format is full of small creatures with utility, but there are going to be times that you are facing down the ten tens, and this is the board wipe that you have in your hand, and it's just it ineffectual. It. All it's doing is killing your own kavu. All right. What's the next one? The next one is Hero of Precinct 1. This is one in a white for a creature human warrior. It's a 2-2, two -two, and it says whenever you cast a multicolored spell, you make a 1-1 one -one white human creature token. Okay. It's a multicolored payoff, but it just makes a 1-1 one -one each time you do it. We have added better multicolored payoffs to the deck. I don't know, even with how many 1-1s one this could make, if it is worth a slot in the deck. It's close. It's a multicolored payoff. But to me, that value is just not what you're looking for in a format like Commander. Interesting. I'm a, yeah, I'm a little surprised just because we have a Planeswalker as Commander and having blockers that we can throw away is generally good. Um, okay, what's the next one? The next one is Path to the World Tree. And this card's bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, sorry, just straight up. I would never play this card in any deck. Definitely. It, it tricks you, though. 
Okay, let's read it. Yeah, it's one in a green for an enchantment. Uh, when Paths of the World Tree enters the battlefield, you can search your deck for a basic land, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle. Into your hand? Yes. So you didn't ramp there. You just fixed. It just drew you a single card, and that card could only be a land. Yes, only a basic land. Yeah. Uh, and then you can pay two and a Wooburg and sacrifice it to, again, have an ability that's a reader. You can gain two life, draw two cards, target opponent loses two life, it deals two damage to up to one target creature, and you make a 2-2 green bear creature token. So a lot of instances of two. I don't know why the two theme was even in there, but it's seven mana to do that. and that path is... to the world tree. <laughs> path number two, the world tree. That's, That's the path. sequel. <laughs> uh, yeah, this card is like super inefficient and just bad. Like two mana to get a land in your hand is like not great. And then seven, you're just never going to do the seven man thing. If you ever pull the trigger on that seven man thing, let me, um, you're in, you're losing that game because you didn't have anything better to do with your seven mana than that. Yeah. Something has gone very wrong if that is your best play. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next one is also has to do with mana. And now I see why we probably added the crystalline crawl or the ornithopter of paradise, some ramp to make up for, uh, some of the mana fixing stuff we had already in the deck because this that last one paths of world tree was a fixer this next one prophetic prism is also a fixer not a ramper it's two mana for an artifact when it enters the battlefield you can draw a card but then you pay one and tap it to add one mana of any color so you don't tap it to add a mana you pay one and tap it so it's not at it giving you more mana than you had it's just filtering that mana into a different color this is i think playable in decks that care about the number of artifacts they have or reoccurring artifacts you you care about that etb this deck does not so, yeah, seems kind of bad. Yeah, you're just not getting enough. We've added cards that give you more. Yep. All right. We're about halfway through here. The next one is Dune Blast. It costs four and a white and a black and a green. So seven total for a sorcery. Choose up to one creature, destroy the rest. It's a board wipe, but it's a seven mana board wipe. They're like, it's multicolored. It's a board wipe. We got to put it in there. You have a Planeswalker as commander, too, so actually you don't care as much about, like, hey, let me save one of my creatures. In general, Planeswalkers are fine with, like, just totally wiping the board because they don't have to worry if there's nothing out there. They're like, fine, no creatures. I've got a Planeswalker. I'm ahead. Exactly. You don't care that much when your commander's a Planeswalker, especially when your Planeswalker is one that can make a creature right after you cast this. You have a board again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's so so really you would prefer a cheaper board wipe that just gets rid of all creatures because you can go destroy all creatures. Now plus one my commander, make a blocker. Now I'm pretty safe. Yeah, exactly. And if your board wipe costs less, then you can maybe cast another spell after it that is more impactful than this saving one of your own creatures mode might be. Now yes, this deck can make, you know, thirteen thirteens, eleven elevens, but it's not necessarily going to do that. Right, and also if you have multiple of those, you do not want to cast this. So yeah. yeah, makes sense to take it out. Okay, what's the next one? The next one is Fusion Elemental. This is a creature that costs Wooburg. It's an 8-8 Elemental. That's it. It has some flavor text. <laughs> <laughs> it does have flavor text. Yeah, it's a vanilla creature. Uh, vanilla 8-8s, I don't care. It would have to be like a 25-25 probably until you're just going to play a vanilla creature, right? Yeah, we have a lot of conversations about what would a vanilla creature's stats have to be to be playable in Commander. And there are some people who say it could literally be infinite, infinite. Uh, though that might be wrong. But it's certainly the case that 8-8 eight, eight is not enough. For five mana, too. Like, yeah. Like a two mana 8-8 eight, eight is still like, hmm, yeah, I'd probably play it. But it's not like, yeah. But five mana? No, thanks. I mean, it does, it is multicolored for all colors does trigger your stuff but again we're not playing jensen so we don't necessarily even care about losing a five color card that's not very efficient right speaking of a five color card that's not very efficient primeval spawn this is one of the new cards yeah yeah it costs five and a wooberg so 10 mana total it's a creature avatar it's a 10 10 uh it has a lot of insurance to make sure that you don't cheat it out uh, if it would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast or no mana was spent to cast it, exile it instead. It has Vigilance, Trample, and Lifelink, and when it leaves the battlefield, you exile the top 10 cards of your deck. You can cast any number of spells from among them with total mana value 10 or less without paying their mana costs. All right, so a 10 mana 10-10 ten, ten, that will give you 10 free CMC worth of stuff off the top 10 cards of your deck. Also has Vigilance, Trample, and Lifelink. I mean, it's big and splashy. Yeah. The value you get for 10 mana is 
maybe there. I wish it was indestructible, at least, man. People are just going to kill this thing. Yeah, I guess the idea is they kill it, and then you get the value off of them killing it, because it's a leaves the battlefield oh, trigger. Sure. But it's just the case that it's 10 mana. It doesn't win you the game. I personally think that people can be too quick to say if it costs 10 mana, it should win you the game. But when it's 10 mana, and it's Wooburg, and it is just a body that, when it enters the battlefield, sits there... It has almost no imme- literal immediate impact. And for me, 10 mana is absolutely too much for something with no literal immediate impact. And for sure, you if, if you got the trigger, it would be pretty good. But you you don't have a bunch of sacrifice outlets or something, right? So you can't even necessarily control that it's going to die or when it dies. So it really is just a 10-10 Vigilance Trample Lifelink, and they could kind of ignore it in some ways. And there's all kinds of tricks, too, to get away with, you know, not taking the Lifelink. They might have propaganda out, or they might be able to, like, I guess they can't block and sack because of the Trample, but still, like, 10 life, you gain 10 life the first time you attack this thing. Like, that's not that bad. You paid a 10-mana spell, and the worst-case scenario for them is, like, we don't touch it, and they gain 10 life and do 10 damage. That's not that bad. So. Exactly. And you hate if this gets Imprisoned in the Moon or Song of the Dryads or any way of removing it that doesn't literally remove it, because then you just got nothing. Yeah, you got totally time-walked. Maybe time-walked twice. Ten mana is a lot. Yeah. Okay, makes sense to take it out. Yep. Uh, two to go. Yeah, the next one is Eluna Apex of Wishes. Uh, this is a mutate creature. So its base cost is two green, blue, red, so five total. Or you can mutate it for three, a hybrid, a hybrid red, green, and two blue. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a 6-6 six, six flying trample, and whenever this creature mutates, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land permanent card. You put that card either onto the battlefield or into your hand. You get to choose. Okay. There are no other mutate cards in the deck. So you are getting at most the one trigger from the one time you mutated it. It is a multicolored creature that I guess you could really hit the lottery on that mutate trigger, but there is a very good chance that you don't, in which case you have just played... Yeah. In which case you've basically played a sort of on-rate kind of chunky flyer, which in Commander is not necessarily the power level you're looking for in your five or six mana play. Yeah, not good enough. Okay, and what's the last card we're cutting from the deck, Jamie? The last cut is Atla Palani, Nest Tender. It is one red, green, white, so four total for a legendary creature, Human Shaman. It's a 2-3 that has the activated ability, pay two and tap it, create a 0-1 green egg creature token with Defender. And then, whenever an egg you control dies, you reveal cards from the top of your deck until you reveal a creature, and you put that creature onto the battlefield, and Mm -hmm. the rest go on the bottom. So, yeah, your eggs hatch into things that are hopefully big, scary creatures. Yes, but... If Outla Palani is removed before any of your eggs die, you just have eggs that don't do anything. Right. There are And no... she's not your commander, so it's not like you can play her again and then use the eggs now. Exactly. There's basically no way to sacrifice the eggs on command. So it is literally just they sit there to disincentivize someone attacking Jared, which is useful, but not at the rate that you're getting... Uh, I just think that this is a very cool card to build around, but it is just not synergistic with the rest of the deck enough. Yeah, you really need sack outlets, and you also want most of your deck to be big, scary creatures. Like, a lot of Atla Polani decks, that's the only creatures in the deck, so that's all you can hit. Um, and Atla's just there to, like, make sure, that, you know, you got a Goblin Bombardment or something, so that you, at the time they attack or do things, like, on at instant speed or on end steps, you can kind of, you know, surprise people. Oh, Primeval Spawn is also a non-bow with it, but we took that out, so I guess that's fine. Yeah. Um, okay, that makes sense to me. That is our 10 cards in. Uh, sorry, 11 cards in, 10 cards out. Let's talk about how the deck plays a little before we wrap up here, Jamie. Yeah, I think you want to obviously ramp quickly. Every deck wants to do that, but this one maybe more than most. Maybe you're going one turn further into the game where ramp is basically your full game plan. Uh, and then the next sort of thing you want to get out is one of these multicolored payoff cards. Mm-hmm. Or even if not multicolored payoff, a card like Tatiova that's just going to give you some value for the game actions you're going to take for the rest of the game, such that at that point, you can play these big five plus mana many color cards and just they are having the big splashy effect that they innately have plus more. Yeah. You've just set up you've set up an engine so that whenever you 
cast really any of your spells, you are getting at least one additional element of value, whether it's damage from mana cannons, card draw, a token, something. And then just kind of go big, make things especially big with Jared's minus ability, and win through combat. Just big trample damage or just a horde of uh, General Ferris Rockerix golems or something like that. Do you think you're playing Jared as soon as you possibly can, or will the be more games where maybe you deploy a couple of creatures first before you cast Jared that first time? I think it's going to depend so much on what your opponents are doing in the sense that Jared upticking to make a 3-3 blocker is pretty good. It will sort of come down to what do I see on board? If an opponent has a really big flyer, it has to be pretty big because Jared's going to uptick to six right away. Uh, But even if it's like 4-4 flyer, that's pretty bad because you're going to get hit go down to two, uptick again, then die. Yeah, and of course then it depends what you have in hand. I I think it is, it's going to be a bit of a mixed bag whether you want to play it right on curve or not. If you've ramped quickly, hopefully you can play it right on curve and you're kind of ahead of the game. You get it out there basically where the 3-3 can block everything and there's no clear way they can get at it. Yeah, I also think there might be some games where just... If you get the right multicolor engine pieces at the right time, you are not super concerned about casting Jared. He and is he's a fun... more of a like come in, put some counters as a kind of like big attack moment. Yeah, he's a fun bonus. He can add to what you're doing, but while the deck is in a literal sense built around him, it is not built to only function via him. Right. If you get general Rokrik or whatever, then yeah. maybe you don't need Jared. You're Although he will create a 4-4, four, four, so maybe you cast him just mostly for that. Exactly, yeah. It's <laughs> never it's never going to be bad to cast him if you're getting some extra payoff off of him and you're getting to uptick him. But I think that there will be instances where maybe you're better off not. Maybe you have just better multicolor cards in your hand than what he gives you. Not to say he's a bad card, but just I think this is one of those cases where the deck can function without the commander. I like those decks, actually. Because people tend to kill your commander sometimes. It's nice that your deck still works. All right, yeah. to the listeners, what do you think of the Painbow Precon? Are there any cards we missed? Any uh, we suggested to take out or add in that you disagree with? Let us know in the comments, on Twitter, all that good stuff. And then remember, if you want to pick up this deck or the Legends Legacy Precon or any draft boosters, collector boosters, anything at all from Dominary United, it's all available right now at channelfirewall.com slash command. Channel Firewall Marketplace has everything a Magic player needs. If you need cards, singles, sealed products, they've got it. It's all licensed businesses on there. They vetted all their vendors, so you know you're getting professional level of service. Again, channelfireball.com slash command is our affiliate link, or you can just type in promo code command at checkout if you forget to put in that link. Uh, And then, of course, once you get the cards, you want to protect them, you don't want anything to happen to them. Ultra Pro is the game accessories brand that we trust our own collections to here at the Command Zone. Can't give it higher praise than that. Jimmy and I have all our stuff in Eclipse sleeves and ultra or other Ultra Pro sleeves. I have some in Guild sleeves and things like that. Uh, in their deck boxes, they make really cool dice. One of the things we've really liked is those Eclipse dice because they're just very clear and they're really good for like content or um, playing over spell table. We're like. It's nice to have fancy dice, but sometimes they can be hard to read on camera, whereas like these Eclipse dice are high quality and just I like that you can just clearly and easily see the numbers on all of them. <laughs> that, that, yeah, don't undervalue that. Yeah, no one's going to accuse you of misrepresenting your board state. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. And we have something cool here. Jamie, you kind of started a tradition here at the Command Zone in the office. Yes, we are now avid fans and watchers of Yella's Marble Runs which uh, we just got into it for the last season of Marbula 1, which is their Formula 1 take where it is marble races. There are a bunch of teams. I think there were 20 teams this season. We all Uh, like chose a team. We we bought the jerseys. We get together at lunch like once a week to watch the marble races. This is on YouTube. Yes. Uh, We should say that. What's it called again? What's the channel name? Uh, Yella's Marble Run. In my head, it's just Marbula 1, but yes. Mm -hmm. And, And it's what you think. They make like the marble racetracks 
it's a pretty intricate track yeah. and then it's an exceptionally intricate area around the track where there's just bleachers full of all of the team supporters the marble of fans yeah you have the o rangers or one of the teams and in the stands you'll just see this one section of the orange marbles and they have banners and signs supporting their teams the marbles have individual specific names backstories coaches they track as the race is going on just like nascar or something like the position how far they are be- behind the leader their their fastest lap time like it's pretty fun it's pretty crazy and intricate um yeah and then of course like yeah i was the turtle sliders what was your team i'm the hazers i've okay. been a hazers fan for a while this was the fun thing is that a few of us were sort of aware of this channel and this phenomenon before but a lot of the staff is just getting into it for the first time now uh, I think everyone had a blast watching this season, and hopefully we're all going to get into the Marble League, which is their take on the Olympics that will start oh, in the fall. For that. <laughs> yeah, so definitely worth checking out on YouTube. It's a lot of fun uh, and something we've had a lot of fun with, and we get to have a little piece of par- pizza parties and root for our team. Exactly. So, turtle sliders for life. He's amazed. <laughs> All right. Uh, big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Damon Lenz, Ashlyn Rose, Arthur Meadowcroft, Craig Blanchett, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Grav Galati, Truck Tie, Jamie Block, Evan Lindberger, Mitch Trafford, and I guess we should say Jimmy Wong as well. And a uh, big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the living card animations that begin our show and often sit behind us here um, on set. Although this one, which is the Vidalcan Orrery from Dominary United for the Game Nights episode was made by Sam. So thanks everybody also for watching. And uh, we've got more Dominary United coming up. We're going to be talking about the, I think we've, we've got the box topper commanders coming up and then we're going to talk about the uncommon uncommon and the monocolored stuff and then we've got the end of 99 so there's still a lot left to go make sure you hit that subscribe button all right that's it we will see you next time peace For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>